Thank you so much. As I begin the second lecture, I just want to speak uh, very clear words of affirmation of RTS as an institution. That's what makes it such a joy to be here, because I believe in what you're doing. And uh, I, I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's not like we can hide. Uh, that's, that's where we are. And by the way, the the is in the name. It's a definite article. It is the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. There are uh, five others, but they have to live under our definite article. <laughs> and I'm very honored to have them. But, you know, in the world of theological education, uh, we desperately need each other. And I am so thankful for what RTS represents and who you are and what you're doing and, and for the strong bonds of affection and relationship and uh, co-laboring that uh, exist between us. So uh, I bring you greetings from the faculty of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, especially the faculty here, uh, who see you as uh, colleagues uh, with whom they are honored to, to work in this great endeavor. We were thinking of the intellectual consequences of Christian belief, but in a way that previous generations of Christians really never considered framing the issue. I want to do this over against the backdrop of everything I said earlier. And just in terms of the way the lecture will work, I presented about 75% of what I wanted to say in that first lecture in order to get the big conceptual issues out there. And I want to be intentionally provocative in the second and shorter lecture in order to get to the time of questions. I want to be provocative because I think that is the mode of Christian theology. We just have to recognize that that is where we are now. Uh, once, we, once we are outside the confines and comforts of Christendom, then if we're saying anything that is uh, genuinely Christian, it is going to be inherently provocative. Uh, we will be uh, provocateurs in the midst of a culture situated in late modernity in which it is increasingly the case that this third condition of belief is articulated by Charles Taylor is just taken for granted. Uh, we will come to expect that when we show up as Christians, we will be considered by those uh, that we confront and, and meet not only as odd and quaint like the Amish, but as dangerous and subversive to the regime. Now, this is where many Christians simply don't understand our current posture. And this is something that I, I have to deal with, and, and you as well, we're going to have to deal with a great deal in terms of where we stand over against some of the biggest cultural conflicts of our age. Uh, I am surrounded by people who just assume, and I don't, I don't mean on my campus, I mean in evangelicalism, uh, speaking more generically. I'm surrounded by people who assume that people think like, like we think, uh, that people believe as we believe, that their intuitions and emotions and affectations and all the rest are, are, are simply... Uh, those things that, uh, that make sense to us. But that's a very dangerous misunderstanding. Let me return to sociology for just a moment. Those whose field of, of labor and intellectual activity is to understand how societies work, understand that every society has a do dominant cognitive mode. And then those outside that dominant cognitive mode are identified as cognitive minorities. And folks, that's where we are. In the condition of late modernity, orthodox biblical Christianity is a posture that is a cognitive minority. Now, cognitive minorities, uh, well, they, they can survive in many settings. They can, they can function in many settings. But it is extremely dangerous for a cognitive minority not to know that it is a minority. Now, why would that lead to confusion in our context? Well, it's because we believe our own publicity. We have been living on the, uh, the, the tidal wave of evangelical bravado and, uh, and braggadocio, and uh, the fact that we have had hopeful statistics that have given us uh, uh, false comfort. The study that was done by Christian Smith that I recited earlier, this massive study that led to the understanding that that most young people, the overwhelming majority of young people who identify as Christians actually hold to this moralistic therapeutic deism, it, it led him to ask the question, where did they get this? And the answer is they got it from their parents. And the answer is they got it from their churches. In other words, one of the problems of being a cognitive minority is not only that you'll be a minority and not know it, <laughs> 
The problem is that you will actually think that you are transmitting and, uh, and passing on a set of cognitive commitments that are actually absent. One of the things that sociologists will, will be able to measure is that cognitive minorities often just disappear. Now, in case you're wondering if that's just hypothetical, that is how Scandinavia, just to take one example, became dechristianized. It wasn't dechristianized in a generation, but it was dechristianized in about three or four generations. And, and what happened is that even when it reached the tipping point, when, when cognitive doctrinal Christians understood that they were in a minority, they lost their own children. Uh, they did not transmit the faith even to their own children. And again, it goes back to what Berger talks about when he, he talks about the problem of pluralization or what uh, Hollinger talks about when he talks about demographic diversification. We hold these truths differently than they were held in the past. Now, just to make that point clear once again, for most of the history of the Christian church, the believers who sit in the pews believed what was taught because it was revealed from God's word, and thus it was a matter of Christian obligation to believe them. Now, just to ask the question, and I, I don't want to show of hands. I don't, want, I don't want any response here. But just let me ask the question. When we stand up to preach, those of us who fulfill this office, and we look out at the people who sit in the pews of evangelical churches, do we really believe that they are listening with an intellectual posture that begins with the understanding that as God speaks from his word, they are intellectually and morally obligated to receive, to believe, and to obey all that is here revealed. Now, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we said yes. And the reason for that is not because they intend to be poor and unfaithful Christians. It is because they live in a world in which nothing else they hear is presented to them in those terms. Nothing. When they watch the news when they listen to a statesman or a politician speak, when they listen to a scientist talk, they do not receive any of these messages as those that require an intellectual obligation to believe and to obey and to base one's life upon these things. There is a tentativeness to everything. And thus, when they come into the church, unless they are well-trained and discipled in terms of what exactly Christian truth lays claim to, then they simply hear it the way they hear the news. Uh, they will hear it the way they hear a fascinating speaker that uh, speaks from science or from any other realm of intellectual discipline. They, they will simply not hear it the way Christians throughout the centuries have heard the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Now, there's a danger here. I want to be very clear about this danger. That danger is the false expectation that there was a golden era to which we can return. That is not what I'm talking about here. That is, evangelical nostalgia is as dangerous as any other evangelical temptation. There is no going back to any golden age. And furthermore, it wasn't as golden as it looked. Uh, because the problems we now face are different, but the people we now face are the same. And, and thus, the fundamental situation has not changed. Christians as a cognitive minority must know that they are a cognitive minority. Now, what this insinuates is the end of cultural Christianity. Now, this is where that demographic diversification Hollinger talks about and the uneven distribution come together because, let's face it, cultural Christianity hasn't disappeared everywhere. As a matter of fact, cultural Christianity is still, still geographically maldistributed. There are places in which there is hardly a vestige of cultural Christianity. There's no cultural Christianity in Manhattan. Now, those who measure such things will say that cultural Christianity is present when identification with some form of religion is considered culturally advantageous. It is, uh, it's absent where it's considered culturally disadvantageous. So just ask the question, if you're a young rising professional, is it to your advantage to identify with some kind of religious group, or is it to your disadvantage, and in particular to Christianity? And the reality is that if you live in, well, Charlotte, you're probably in a middle zone. I, I don't live in Charlotte, but I have visited here, and 
Charlotte's pretty much like Atlanta or Dallas or any other major Sunbelt city. There are pockets here where it would be to your advantage to identify as a Christian or a member of a Christian church, but there are pockets here already where it would be to your disadvantage. My guess is if you want tenure at Queens College, it's probably to your disadvantage. Uh, if, however, you, uh, you, you want to get hired in certain other settings, it might be to your ad advantage. And, and still it would be to your advantage to belong to some churches in a community like Charlotte where you would at least make social connections which could be personally and professionally advantageous. If you live in, uh, in, in Manhattan, not so much. Uh, there, for instance, if you are going to identify in some way with a Christian organization or with a congregation, it has to be on aesthetic terms. And so, as you'll note, the New York Times continues to write review after review after review of the music at St. Thomas Church. And it's assumed that the people who are there are there because of the quality of the music. It is considered one of the finest choirs and repositories of, and, and displays of classical music to be found anywhere in America. And um, no one really assumes that someone who belongs there is there because of the 39 articles of the Anglican Church or for any kind of, uh, of serious cognitive investment. We've been told that it is the obligation of all right-minded persons to take into full account the intellectual consequences of modernity. I think we did that. And uh, by that, I don't mean uh, in the last lecture. I mean, I, I think that's what Western civilization has been doing for the last 200 or 300 years, is, and that is taking into account the full consequences of modernity. And again, it's not evenly distributed. Cultural Christianity and, and the comforts of cultural Christianity are still found both demographically in terms of geography and in terms of generation. But for instance, Berger and others will point out that cultural Christianity <laughs> disappears the closer you get to a major center of academic influence. Cultural Christianity disappears when you get closer to the engines of cultural production in America. Hollywood is not a deeply invested uh, theological center of gravity, and uh, nor would the editorial board of the New York Times be described as such. The engines of cultural production are in the hands of those who overwhelmingly are committed to uh, the, the worldview of late modernity. And evidence of that, by the way, would be a, a columnist such as Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, and with whom I engage regularly. Kristof, back in 2004, wrote an article about Christmas, and, and, and it's one of those articles that tells you everything you need to know about the New York Times, uh, which, by the way, is still the most important newspaper in America. If you're not reading the New York Times, you do not understand the conversation going on in, uh, in the elites of this culture. Nicholas Kristof wrote an article in which he wanted to shock people. It was about Christmas of 2004, and he wrote this article saying that two polls had just come out the previous week. One of them showed that 75% of Americans don't believe in Darwinism. Th that is, they're just not accepting it at full force. Now, that, that's so scandalous to Nicholas Kristof, he doesn't know what to do with that. Here you have a Rhodes Scholar who looks at the fact that all these Americans don't accept evolution. Now, if you looked further in the data, he wouldn't be too concerned because they're not teaching at Harvard. The 75% of Americans who don't accept evolution are living in places where you can survive without affirming evolution. Uh, they're safely outside the engines of cultural production. But at the same time, that same week, another poll had come out showing that something like 75% of Americans say that they believed in the virgin birth. Now, once again, the theologian in me says, I'm not accepting the fact that three of the four people I meet actually believe in the virgin birth, but they felt at least it was something that they wanted to affirm rather than to deny. Nicholas Kristof said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing him here, he said, I don't want to live in a country in which more people believe in the virgin birth than in evolution. Well, he does, actually. He just doesn't have to see many of these people. But to someone like Nicholas Kristof, it's simply unthinkable. It's it's beyond unthinkable that people would continue to hold to this. As recently as last week, he wrote another piece like this in which it's all of a sudden he discovers these people. It, it, it's, like, it's like we are the subject of this National Geographic investigation <laughs> in, in which you know somewhere there are people in New York who are watching a DVD of us going, that is the strangest tribe I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and, and they're here. And they're breeding. But in the end, they still win. We need to recognize they're winning. Uh, they're winning because they set the terms of the debate. 
And what many evangelical Christians and, and especially uh, educators and, and, and parents and pastors don't understand is that the conditions of belief in late modernity have changed the way that beliefs are believed and the way that they are held and accepted. Well, if we've been told that what we have to do is come to full account of the intellectual consequences of modernity, I want to suggest that the responsibility of Christians is now the reverse. Over against the reality of the late modern age, we've got to reconsider the intellectual consequences of Christian belief. In other words, the tables have been entirely turned. It was the, the modernists who were the revolutionaries in the wake of the Enlightenment. We've got to be the revolutionaries now. The, the framers of the, of the modern age came to understand that they would have to leave behind structures of thought that were inherently incompatible with modernity. And we're going to have to understand that we're going to have to do the very same thing in reverse. We have been breathing this air. We have been receiving these messages. We have been tuned to this frequency more than we would like to think. Even those of us who consider ourselves confessional Protestants must recognize that we sometimes believe in ways that are more, are more in line with late modernity, even when we believe these things, than when, for instance, our forebears in the faith believed these very same things. They're believed differently. We have to unthink. A part of what we must do in terms of intellectual responsibility is go through an intentional process of detoxification. We've got to turn the tables so that we're no longer as Christians trying to defend the Christian truth claim over against the claims of modernity. We need to turn the tables for believers who understand themselves to be a cognitive minority to rethink modernity in terms of the intellectual consequences of Christianity. That's going to take an enormous amount of our investment. I'm going to suggest, however, that has to be one of the central ambitions of the church. Otherwise, there will be no Christianity in the next generation. We have to turn the tables because the, the experiment or the project of trying to redefine Christianity or even tenaciously to refuse to redefine Christianity in the conditions of late modernity is a failed project. It is a failed project because if you accept the overwhelming and, and ubiquitous reality of late modernity and its ways of thinking as the norm, you will end up with no Christianity. It is impossible to have biblical Christianity in a world in which the normative forms of thought are established by what Charles Taylor told, the conditions of belief in which it is impossible to believe. In other words, Christianity can disappear even where it is supposedly affirmed. Now, what would this require of us? This is where I intend to be provocative. I want to suggest that there are theological and, of course, moral consequences of Christian belief. And these are deeply subversive of the modern project in ways that will make us uncomfortable as well as the moderns. For instance, just start with theism. Theism is, of course, what grounds ontology for Christians. And we have to recognize that the question as to whether or not there is a God is far more fundamental than most Christians have ever considered. In other words, most people, including most Christians in cultural Christianity or institutional Christianity, inhabit what is actually an intellectual middle ground between theism and atheism. By the way, most atheists do too. Uh, Nietzsche is right. The, 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 only, the only responsible answer to atheism is nihilism. Most atheists are not nihilists, which means that they are also accommodating themselves to some kind of modification of their worldview. But Christians have been doing the same thing. That accommodationist posture is not only found amongst those who, who commit themselves publicly to a platform of accommodation, as we've seen, that accommodationist posture is what even non-accommodationist evangelicals ended up doing while well, they denied that that was what they were doing. Middle ground will not suffice. The only way to remain Christian in the context of late modernity is to take theism in terms of its full force, which means the question of the existence or non-existence of God is the most determinative question imaginable. 
The negative answer to that question means that we are indeed alone in the universe. We're the participants in a great cosmic accident, and there is no meaning in our life together, our individual lives separately, or anything we might do or say or be. It is all simply going to disappear into the meaninglessness from which it emerged. On the other hand, if there is a God, then everything is fundamentally changed. And then we are in the position that you find in terms of the Old Testament. The question is, if there is a God, who is this God? And what is his disposition towards us? If our being is grounded in the existence of a a self-existent God, which is fundamental to theism, then how is this God disposed to us? What does he require of us? That leads to the second big issue in terms of our confrontation with modernity, and that's the epistemological confrontation, which comes down to the doctrine of revelation. We must recognize just how audacious it is to believe not only that there is a God, but that this God is a speaking God who has communicated himself to us meaningfully. As Carl Henry one of my mentors has put it so poetically, and he wasn't usually poetic. (laughs) Carl Henry said that revelation is God's gracious self-disclosure whereby he generously forfeits his own personal privacy that his creatures might know him. Now that's, that's revelation. It's not enough that there is a God because if this God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know who he is nor what his disposition to us might be. But because of God's grace and mercy to us, he has revealed himself to us. And of course, in the scripture, we have a comprehensive understanding of revelation, from general revelation to special revelation, from scriptural revelation to incarnational revelation. But this establishes us once again where the reformers were in the 16th century. We have to stake our lives on the fact that there is a God who speaks and that he has spoken to us uniquely and perfectly and in a perfectly trustworthy way in the written words of Scripture. Now, you need to recognize that, again, in the intellectual conditions of late modernity, this is so subversive, this is so radically countercultural that if we hear ourselves speak these things and understand what we are saying, We have to recognize we are setting ourselves not against the periphery of the worldview that is around us, but against its heart and core. We're actually saying that there is a God. That establishes the fact that there is an authority over us, the him with whom we have to do. And he has spoken to us such that we are not left with uh, the creativity of idolatry. Those of you who, uh, who study idolatry in the Old Testament, you'll know that it comes, it comes down to creativity. This is what fallen, depraved human beings do. As Calvin said, the human heart is an idol-making factory. We fabricate. But fabrication is forbidden to us. We've got to deal with a God who not only exists, but who has revealed himself. He has revealed all things necessary to us. Now, this again, this, this, this leads to a situation in which if the people out there hear us as saying what we're actually saying, we cannot be merely odd. We are deeply dangerous because we are claiming a privileged source of information that trumps all other sources of information. Now, let's just go ahead and get some backbone on this. Let's recognize that if we really believe that there is a God who has spoken in a trustworthy and perfect way in Scripture that it really does trump every other form of knowledge. It does really trump every other knowledge claim. Now, there are even evangelicals and conservative Christians whose voice is going to crack when they say that. Because we live in a world in which it is no longer plausible in the world's terms to believe that. But it was no longer plausible to believe that actually in early modernity. It was less plausible in mid-modernity. Now it's not only not plausible, it is subversive of the regime. When you consider today's moral debates, this is exactly where we are. You don't understand what's going on in today's moral debates in the larger culture if you do not understand that what they hate more than our position on these issues is the fact that we claim to show up with a superior source of moral knowledge, an objective 
source of moral knowledge, even a transcendent source of moral knowledge. This runs not only counter to their project, but destructive of their entire worldview. They understand that. Often we do not. We, we are puzzled by their response to us because, after all, it's this issue and that issue. But it's not just this issue and that issue. It's the claim that we're making in terms of a God who speaks. Because if there is a God, and he does speak, then it's not only we who are obligated to obey and to believe what he has spoken. And that's why it's so deeply subversive to the regime. Authority, of course, enters into this because the ontological ground of authority is the self-existent God. Authority enters into this in terms of knowledge because of a biblical epistemology, which comes down to the fact that we only know the most important things we know because they've been revealed to us, and then we must know them not only because they've been revealed to us, but we must know them in the terms with which they have been revealed to us. The intellectual consequences of the doctrine of revelation are inadequately understood by conservative Christians who claim to be the last people who believe in the doctrine of revelation. We're going to find ourselves in a lot of trouble on this because the epistemology, which is at the very heart of the modern project, denies the very possibility of what we consider to be most central. We show up in a cultural conversation and we represent not only those who come with an alternative worldview, the, 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 the academic world, the intellectual elites, the modern age is not threatened by alternative worldviews. It celebrates them. It's a worldview that says there are really no alternatives. That's the problem. Because the Christian who really shows up on the basis of divine revelation cannot accept as a permanent condition the, uh, the obligations claimed by other rival worldviews. And of course, then you just follow through the basic doctrines of the, of, of the structure of systematic theology, the doctrine of creation. You know, this is one of the continuing controversies, not only out there in terms of the, of the collision with the secular world, but even now in some very lamentable and, and uh, interesting, to say the least, conversations among and within the evangelical world. Uh, what are we obligated to in terms of the understanding of creation? Well, taken in biblical terms, the doctrine of creation is just like every other doctrine. It's as deeply subversive of the modern world and the modern experiment as we could possibly imagine. The world does not exist on its own terms. Uh, the, the world does not exist as a cosmic accident. The world is the purposive creation of a self-existent, self-revealing God who is bringing glory to himself as he sovereignly rules and reigns over the creation that he has made for his own glory and is on this pale blue dot bringing glory to himself in a way that is definitive and according to his own self-revelation, the, the very center of his divine passion in redeeming a people by the blood of his son. Now, do you understand just what that sounds like to the average faculty member at the University of Iowa? <laughs> that the entire meaning of the cosmos with all of its billions and billions of stars and... <laughs> And all the rest comes down to the fact that God intended to glorify himself through saving sinners on this planet. I mean, that's, that's so audacious. It's breathtaking. It's, it's more audacious for us than it was for our great-grandparents. It's far more audacious when you've seen through the Hubble telescope. It's far more audacious when you've seen through the electron microscope. All of this... All of this exists, as Calvin said, so that it might be the theater of God's glory for the drama of redemption. Yes, it does. Now, there are all kinds of interesting debates to be had about ecology and global warming and all kinds of things like that, and this is not the time to settle those issues. It is the time to say we can't enter into those conversations the same way others enter into them. And because of that, because we believe that this cosmos has a purpose, that is revealed to us. It's not one that we intuited, nor is it one that we simply privileged because we're the multi-celled, higher critical mammals who are able to think such analytical thoughts, but because we claim they've been revealed to us by the Creator. Anthropology. Here again, our confrontation with the, the worldview of late modernity is it's direct. It's, it's unavoidable. We fundamentally redefine what it means to be human. Because the self-existent, self-revealing God 
says that the most important thing about us is that human beings uniquely are made his image. Therefore, we can't talk about human beings in the mechanistic, reductionistic, individualistic terms of modern secular theory. The modern worldview just assumes a meaning of humanity that we actually have to deny at virtually every single point. The philosophers of human rights are thrown right now into a quandary if you're following that argument. The existence of human rights has become a major issue of concern to the philosophers and the ethicists simply because they recognize they have no grounding for it. And so even in the last week, there have been a couple of works that have come out from leading theorists in terms of human rights trying to find some grounding for human rights. The problem that the secular human rights theorists have is that humanity in itself turns out to be an adequate grounding for anything that might be called human rights. The, the only source of anything that might be rightly construed as what we would call human rights is going to have to come from outside humanity. And that's going to require theism. And then again, head-on collision. Now again, Christians are able to look at the secular world and say, your thinking is wrong. We have to think differently. But most conservative Christians don't think, well, to put it crudely, differently enough. And understand that that means that, for instance, we have to push back. The intellectual consequences of Christian belief mean that, that the sense of personal autonomy that is so much a central part of the Enlightenment project can't be a part of ours. And, and, and that's why, to fast forward to go to the doctrine of the church, I mean, we have to understand that we forfeit our autonomy. First of all, we don't have it. It's easy to forfeit something you don't have. Biblically, we don't have it. So not having it, it's kind of easy to give it up. <laughs> you know, we need to be like the folks, you know, alcoholics, and I'm so, oh, I'm Al, I used to think I was autonomous. Uh, you know, you just want to say, you know, we, we, we gave it. Hi, Al, thank you. Yes, yeah, right. We gave it up. We gave it up. But the reality is that most of the people who sit in the pews of evangelical churches haven't given it up. They're trying to hold in some middle ground where, where they want to suggest that there is a creator and that this creator has created us, his image, and, and yet we're still autonomous. That, that quest for autonomy is what got Adam and Eve cast out of Eden. It was not one of God's gifts to them in Eden. And then the sin, the sin issue, and then the fall. This is where, by the way, just to insert a footnote... The existence of an historical Adam is absolutely necessary to the gospel. We have a fundamental understanding of the human problem. Every worldview has to give some kind of, of substantial answer to the problem of humanity. And, and we have a short three-letter answer called sin. Now, again, conservative Christians think they believe in sin. And that, that's why, for instance, uh, you know, there, you have these younger evangelicals who were raised in a legalistic, moralistic culture, and they're trying to find some category for sin, and so, you know, I make them read Reinhold Niebuhr. Now, don't worry, I'm not a Niebuhrian. But Niebuhr does something very, very important. He knocks out the pretensions of the moralists and shows, just as he did in Detroit, that both the, the industrialists and the auto workers are entrapped in structures of sin from which they simply cannot extricate themselves. I don't want them to end there, but it is interesting that someone like Carl Henry was very intellectually obligated to the same understanding, uh, coming to the conclusion that, uh, that sin is a deeper problem than moralism can possibly answer for. And, and thus, we have conservative Christians who are able to look at a cultural conversation in which sin has been eradicated from the vocabulary and say, we have to put sin back into this. We have to find some crack into which we can reinsert the category of sin. And so that's what, that's what we try to do. We try to show up in a cultural conversation. And even though we might try to dress this up and use some other kind of vocabulary, the reality is we want to say, don't do that. But we're fundamentally misunderstood. And, and the reason for that is even conservative Christians don't understand why we're misunderstood. It's because the average child growing up in a Christian home, in an evangelical home, is told, don't do that. And if you do that, there will be consequences. By the way, that's good parenting. It's just not good parenting through the life cycle. At some point, Christians have to come to know, or those raised in a Christian home, those who are hearing Christian preaching have to come to understand that the thou shalt nots are for our good. We, we, we have bought into the modern mentality that tells us that, that we would be 
free but for the bonds that uh, bind us of moral obligation. But just take the issue in the debates over marriage or over sexuality. When we show up and say that homosexuality is a sin, what the secular world hears us saying, and frankly, what most of the people sitting in our pews hear us saying is, we know that that's probably something you would like to do. But God says no, so don't do it. We fail to show up and say, the law of God is to show us that which is good for us. That real human happiness and real human flourishing can only be found within the structures and institutions that were given to us by the Creator who gave them to us for our good. That, that indeed, these acts that we call obedience, and even God rightly calls obedience, are rightly acts that even the most narcissistic creature, but for his own self-deception, would follow for his own pleasure and fulfillment and flourishing. It is not that we want less for you, we want more for you. The other problem is, is that when we come to, to the, the problem of sin, we also have created a generation of Christians who believe that this is a problem that we have dealt with or that God dealt with, and it's over. And that is a fundamentally unbiblical understanding. The atonement is accomplished. But we fool ourselves, and we do so in a way that is immediately detected by the secular world as being dishonest. When we talk about sin as someone else's problem. When we talk about these issues, we have to recognize these issues are prevalent in our pews maybe even our pulpits. These are struggles that we all know. These are realities that we have to recognize are so diabolical that there is no rescue from them but divine rescue. The unilateral act of God and his mercy to us in Jesus Christ. So this is a problem. We, we are born moralists and we're now raising moralists in a culture in which moralism not only makes no sense, but just obviously does not work. Our doctrinal affirmations of Christ run immediately counter to everything the modern world represents. You take Lessing's ugly ditch, you can know nothing about the history, you can know nothing about the past. You know, the reality is we're claiming that we know exactly what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And we're claiming to have a supernaturally given, perfect and trustworthy record of what a man 2,000 years ago said and did. Furthermore, it is not so much that the incarnation of Jesus Christ is a great scandal to the modern mind because they can cognitively demystify that. It's when you show up and make a clear claim of the singularity of Christ that you find you are at the very heart of the modern project and you are not only a rebel, you are a criminal. If you go on a college campus today, a major college campus, and affirm the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are not written off as a crank. You are not dismissed as a hillbilly. You are considered to be intolerant. You are an oppressor. You are doing damage. By the way, on moral judgments, it's the same thing. Judge Von Walker's decision in the Proposition 8 trial in California, in which uh, Judge Walker invalidated the, uh, the voters of California in terms of adopting Proposition 8 to state the marriage is a union of a man or a woman, is, and, and only that. You may recall, if you looked at the actual decision, that there is something embedded in that that is as subversive of the Christian worldview as anything we can imagine. It, it, is, it is one of the most dangerous legal precedents ever established in the history of the United States of America. That federal court ruled that the belief that homosexuality is a sin is legally construed a harm against homosexual persons. Now, if that does not sink in as demonstrating just how dangerous to the regime biblical Christians are now considered, then nothing will. We are now, for purposes of law, in a case that has just been affirmed by the Ninth Circuit, we are declared to be harming persons, a due legal harm by the belief that homosexuality is a sin. Again, 
to say that Christ is Savior is not all that offensive because that can be demystified, but you can't demystify singularity. You cannot demystify exclusivity. And that's what will get us into trouble. By the way, this is where the average college student or high school student now finds himself or herself in a very difficult place that most of us never had to inhabit. When all of a sudden there's a, an exchange student from India, and when they begin to talk with one another, this Indian teenager asks your teenager, are you really telling me that all my ancestors are in hell? Well, that's when you find out just what cognitive hold the Christian faith has upon that teenager. How many of our teenagers should be considered as having any kind of doctrinal substance or any kind of tools for cultural rebellion and, and biblical faithfulness that will allow them to say what must be said? And, and then, of course, the missiological uh, and, uh, and second commandment kinds of, of skills to know how to say that, not just in terms of making an objectively right theological declaration, but in having a purpose whereby a relationship can be established such that this can be a word of grace as well as a necessary word of judgment. The Christian life has to be redefined in terms of rebellion. This is very clear in the Bible. It's very clear in the New Testament. It's very clear, for instance, in the epistles of Peter. Peter writes to rebels. He writes to aliens who are dispersed throughout Asia Minor. He writes to those who know they have no rightful claim upon citizenship. He writes to those who know they are subversive to the regime, so much so that Peter tells them, when you are arrested, be arrested for doing what has to be declared good. So that even when they arrest you, they have to speak well of you but expect to be arrested. We have to redefine the Holy Spirit in terms of our understanding of what it means to affirm the Trinity in this situation of late modernity. Most evangelical Christians are afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit because we'll turn into charismatics. There's a, there's a wrong way to talk about the Holy Spirit. There is a, there's an unbiblical way to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. However, there is no church if there is no Holy Spirit. There is no Christian life, and there is no assurance of the gospel without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indeed the assurance of the fact that the church will continue into eternity. How many Christians today understand our absolute dependence upon the present ministry of the Holy Spirit to encourage and to keep? The church has to be redefined as a subversive community of which we are elect members. The church has to be redefined as an institution that stands out from the culture in ways that are not only odd and eccentric, but again, dangerous and subversive. We should expect the no cultural privileges for the church. We should expect the church to have to exist in terms of its divine protection and provision and human sacrifice. There will be a high social cost. So the social capital to belong to a biblical congregation is going to be increasing exponentially as we move later and later into late modernity. It is going to cost us more to be members of a church. At some point, whereas in cultural Christianity it was a benefit to be a member of this church, now it is a scandal. And again, all you have to do is think about some of the most current stories in the press to understand that belonging to a church that would hold this is simply unthinkable. And the only answer to this is the required and mandated secularization. And, and that's the birth control mandate debate. That's really what it's all about. It, it, is, it is inconceivable to the regime that anything can trump reproductive freedom. That anything can. And that's the only way the regime can deal with that is by doing exactly what the secularization theorists said would happen, by secularizing even new things. What, what the federal government is effectively saying is, we don't need your hospitals. We don't need your adoption agencies. We will do that, thank you. We once depended upon you to do that, and you did it out of Christian compassion. It wasn't that sweet of you to start it. But that's what we do now. We do it better. We do it according to our own rules. And now you can't even do it. And thus you have Christian adoption agencies in places like Massachusetts, somebody shutting down because they cannot in conscience place children into homosexual homes, uh, to homosexual couples. And, and now the regime says, well, if you won't play by our rules, you can't even do this anymore. Now, where are the churches that understand 
that we're going to have to arm a generation to face far worse than that. That, that. That's not some kind of eschatological fear. That is a clear and present reality. And finally, eschatology. We're going to have to live in eschatology, which is where the church has always lived. I was not too long ago talking to a major Shakespeare scholar here in the United States. and He's a man who's he's not a believer, but he's, he's taught Shakespeare for generation after generation after generation in one of our Ivy League institutions. And he said to me, teaching Shakespeare is getting harder and harder every year. And I said, why? He said, because at least half of Shakespeare is about sexual longing. And he said, I'm teaching kids that haven't longed for sex. In a hooking up culture, Shakespeare's sonnets make no sense. That entire body of literature only makes sense if something is denied to you now you desperately want in the future. And you will write sonnets and write poetry. And he said, you can't teach Shakespeare to a generation that doesn't know sexual yearning. Well, he was talking about Shakespeare. That hit me like an atom bomb. We have a generation, we are a generation of evangelical Christians who've been too much at home in this world. We've been far too satisfied. You can't teach the Bible to people who aren't yearning for eternity. You really can't teach the gospel to people who have everything they want right now. The only way the Bible can be taught is to people who say, we need shalom. We desperately seek a kingdom. We, like Abraham, are looking for a city that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. Never such innocence again, clearly. James Orr in the last century, actually, no, the last, last century, said that between the Christian worldview and the modern worldview, there is a deep and radical antagonism. We've been trying to live for the last several generations as if there is no deep and radical antagonism. We don't look merely strange. We now look dangerous. The disappearance of cultural Christianity in the space of virtually one generation for most Americans means that we're in a fundamentally changed situation for which many Christians, perhaps most Christians, are just unaware. The question is, what do we do now? What is the future of evangelicalism? I don't think there is any such thing. I think there's only the future of the church. And that means the future of congregations that are deeply biblical. This generation is going to have to be radical, biblical, ecclesial. It's going to have to be global and missional in its expression of biblical orthodoxy. Or we will discover what, if we're honest, we're already discovering. About 30 years ago, only about 1% of Christians in the world were in Africa. Now about 24% of the Christians in the world are in Africa. We're going to discover that we're living in Finland in a de-Christianized society. It'll take more time than Finland, but it is inevitable. We live east of Eden. The world we inhabit will be as distant as that between our grandparents and ourselves but far more than that between ourselves and our grandchildren. Never such innocence again. The intellectual consequences of Christian belief. We don't hold anything innocently anymore. We can't hold anything simply because it's been handed to us anymore. We can't hold these truths as if we don't understand how deep the antagonism is with the worldview around us. We have to hold things not with innocence, but with conviction. And that's an altogether different thing. I spoke longer than I intended there. But I want to thank you for listening. It's been an honor to be with you. And we do have some time for some questions.